Good morning, everyone. I want to formally welcome you to the January 19th, 2022 uh, MAPC Executive Committee meeting. Uh, my name is Erin Wartman. I am the president of MAPC. And um, today's meeting is being uh, conducted uh, obviously via Zoom video conference consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, and as extended by section 2475, signed by Governor Baker on June 16th, 2021. Section 2475 also allows town councils, state boards, and other bodies to continue to hold remote public meetings until April 1st, 2022. To provide public access to the meeting while limiting the potential abuse for video conferencing technology, uh, members of the public may view the proceedings at youtube.com backslash user backslash MAPC Metro Boston. And just keep in mind if you share your camera and uh, you can see us, we can see you. So just be mindful of that. Uh, so whether you're watching this live or in syndication, thank you for joining us. And with that, the first item on the agenda is we're going to call attendance. So I will do that at this time. So if members will please unmute, uh, we will do that. Here we go. Sharonda Almeida. Keith Bergman. Present. Karen Canfield. Adam Chapdelaine. Present. Uh, Bob Cohen. Mayor Curtitone. Tom Daniel. John DePriest. Present. Yolanda Greaves. Sandra Hackman. Here. Uh, Mo Handel. Tabor Keeley. Here. Angie Liu. Steve Olinoff. Present. Caitlin Passafaro. George Proagas. Here. Courtney Rainey. Present. Jenny Raitt. Present. Vandana Rao. Sam Seidel. Here. Uh, Steve Silvera. Here. Lauren Shirtliff. Mayor Spicer. Juan Vega. Elaine Vanya. Here. And Erin Wartman. That's me. Here. All right, thank you so much, everyone. And if you uh, come in after your name has been called at any point during the meeting, just pop it in the chat and we'll make sure to capture your attendance at this meeting. Great. Next up on the agenda is the approval of minutes from December 9th, 2021. Uh, they were distributed uh, or, uh, before this meeting by Mark via email. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns? Not seeing any, so at this time, I would like to um, ask I'll for a motion. motion to approve. A motion made by Tabor. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so the motion has been made by Tabor to adopt, uh, to approve the minutes, and a second was made by Sam Seidel. Any questions, comments, concerns? Not seeing any, great job guys. All right, uh, here comes roll call because we're on Zoom, roll call is required. Sharonda? Keith? Aye. Karen? Canfield? Adam? Aye. Bob Cohen? Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda? Sandra? Aye. Mo Handel? Tabor? Aye. Angie? Steve Olinoff? Aye. Caitlin? George? Aye. Courtney? Aye. Jenny? Vandana? Aye. Okay. Vandana? Sam? Yes. Fido? Yep. Steve Silvera? Aye. Uh, Lauren, Mayor Spicer, Juan, Elaine, Aye. 
and Erin, I. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much, everyone. Next up on the agenda is the report of the treasurer. Treasurer Sam. Thank you, oh, President Erin. Oh. I think Mark has something. Yep. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't see your little the little icon hand. Go ahead, That's Mark. That's okay. Um, I just want to note that I think, and I could have my um, count wrong, I might ask Sasha or Andrea to help me with this, but I believe we have 13 people, which is just a quorum by one. So um, <clears throat> we need to make sure that nobody leaves, or if you do, let us know. Um, and I am a little concerned about that because we have some routine votes at the beginning, but then we have an adoption of the work plan toward the end. Um, so mm -hmm. I just want I have to be uh, aware. I have to leave by 1230. Could I suggest that we rearrange the schedule so we can do the work plan earlier? And that is acceptable. That? Yeah, if that's acceptable to Aaron, it's certainly acceptable to me. It is. I was going to suggest that as well. Okay. Okay, yeah. Sam. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for kind of confirming that. I'm working on one screen today, so I don't have my usual uh, appearance. So please be uh, gentle with me as I try and see all the hands in the chat comments and everything else. Um, so if there is no um, opposition. We are going to take the items out of order at this time. So we are going to now take number six, which is review and approval of the FY22 work plan covering the following departments, arts and culture, environment, municipal collaboration, public health, and strategic initiatives. Mark, would you like to introduce um, the topic? Sure. And I'm actually going to begin by introducing a couple of staff members. I, I don't know if they have been at um, uh, board meetings before. Allison Zimmon is joining us. She is our deputy counsel. She's here with Margie Weinberger, who of course is our chief counsel. Um, and also uh, more recently, uh, we have Angela Brown, who is our chief of economic development, who is attending her first board meeting. Uh, we don't uh, we don't hire that many new managers and directors at MAPC, so we are very happy to have Angela with us as our latest addition to the leadership team. And we also have um, Matt Walsh with us, who is a new staff person in government affairs. I think I've got the new members of the, of the staff. Um, we are presenting today the second half of the work plan. It's really sort of the second, the last 40% of the work plan. We did most of it last time. Um, the, uh, I'm going to ask each director or departmental representative who is here to give us just a couple of highlights from this year's work plan from their section. And um, because we're taking this out of order, we may not have everybody um, as quickly as I had hoped, but we do have two departments represented. Annis is here, our director of arts and culture. And uh, she is going to present on behalf of that department. And then I see Christian Brandt, who has recently been promoted to community engagement manager, <clears throat> although he's been with us as a community engagement specialist and planner for several years. He is going to present on behalf of community engagement, which was part of the Department of Strategic Initiatives and is in this work plan next year, will be a separate uh, section of the work plan. Starting with Annis, if we could. Thanks, Mark, and it's good to be here. Good to see everybody. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about a couple of key things I think we were working on this year in our work plan. One is really finding ways to support arts and culture being embedded into recovery, especially in um, downtown revitalization. Um, and we have a few different projects where we've been working on LRRP implementation work, um, working with the city of Beverly as they have an artist residence program to bring back their um, downtown and their cultural district. And then we also have been doing a lot of work trying to deepen support for municipalities to work with artists by helping to expand what our learnings from the installation project to help develop um, 
public arts commissioning processes and policies in Watertown and Salem. Um, and we're also learning about cultural facilities through a project to support the Malden Center for Arts and Culture concept then in Malden. So those are some of the big things that we're working on right now. Um, it's getting us a, a lot of really great um, opportunity to dive into some of the core challenges. Thanks. Any particular questions on the arts and culture section? I want to emphasize that no one's giving a complete rendition of everything they do. There's a lot more there, um, both in the, uh, in the strategic priorities that are summarized in the work plan and also in ongoing work activities that are not always summarized in the work plan because we, we try and focus on kind of emerging strategic priorities in the work plan. Any questions for Anna? Hearing none, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to Christian to talk a little bit about community engagement. Hello everyone, um, I am very happy to be here. Um, so Emily had a plan to be here, but she is double booked uh, with a really exciting training. Um, so I'm happy to talk a little bit about um, the work that Emily has been doing with um, the uh, new community engagement department, um, specifically on uh, a coalition of diversity, equity, and inclusion municipal staff. So as many of you I'm sure are aware, there has been a proliferation of DEI staff among municipalities. And one of the things that Emily has been working on over the last um, six months to a year is bringing those staff members from across our region together to work through um, what their jobs will be like, what kind of change they're interested in doing, um, working on sort of developing a collaborative space for them to both learn about new ideas, hear from each other about how best to um, implement their um, DEI initiatives in their communities. Um, and we're looking forward to continuing doing that work um, as a department. Um, I think Emily was planning to share a little bit more as well about what our aspirations are as a department. Um, included in that, I think, are sort of expanding our uh, work in terms of developing community engagement um, practices and models that we can share with um, communities in our region, providing additional resources for the communities in our region to really excel in the engagement that they're doing for their, um, with their constituents. Um, and so some of those things include working on the DEI initiative that Emily was just mentioning, um, really building out some of our um, uh, best practices research. Um, so something that we just recently released was the hybrid um, engagement initiative uh, through our hybrid engagement hub, um, which some of you might have heard of, heard about this morning in the inner core um, sub-regional meeting, uh, thanks to Sasha who presented on that. Um, so we're excited to keep doing uh, some of that work and focusing more on um, supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives throughout the region. So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. So I have, I have notified the other members of the team um, that they are, uh, you know, that we've taken up the work plan a little bit earlier than anticipated, but we are expecting Barry Keppard from Public Health, Mark Fine from Municipal Collaboration, Eric Hove from Strategic Initiatives, and Van Du uh, from Environment. Uh, Martin could not be with us today, but they don't seem to have joined so, the screen. So, oh, so Van is here and I just let Eric in. So oh, if good, it's okay, good, good. let's do uh, Environment with Van first. And Eric, as you uh, kind of enter the room, you will be next after Environment. Can I introduce Van momentarily? Aaron, um, yes, Van is course. still a relatively new member of our environment team. She plays um, many roles at MAPC in both climate and environment, but um, probably her most popular role is um, overseeing the Advancing Climate Resilience Program because that gives direct grants to municipalities for climate adaptation work uh, funded through the Barr Foundation. She's done a great job running that program. Uh, she is standing in for Martin today who had another commitment. Um, Van, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Aaron. I've never been called popular before, so that's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I, I guess I'll just share just a quick highlights of some of the initiatives and efforts um, for on behalf of the environment team. And so um, externally with projects and just ideas and, and kind of um, efforts that we want to look forward to have been working on looking forward to is continue integrating and thinking about um, climate adaptation and resilience planning efforts um, in you know in, in corporate supporting communities through technical assistance um, to think about these planning efforts in in um, the other uh, you know planning efforts across the the different um, projects that that communities are doing too so um, uh, mark was just mentioning the Accelerating Climate Resilience um, Program that has been going well. Um, so over the past three years, we have um, provided mini resilience mini grants to um, over 20 communities, um, and they have been seeing um, progress in terms of capacity building, um, as well as kind of um, setting, planting the seeds for some technical assistance, thinking about infrastructure, green infrastructure, nature-based solutions um, projects. So that will, we hope to continue um, with that work going forward as well, continue working with um, the Bar Foundations to think about what's next. Um, but also we have seen that um, the, the, the grant has been um, supportive and helpful to communities when thinking about supplementing or supporting them along with the MVP action grant projects that they're um, working on or pursuing. And so um, we want to make sure to um, work with communities providing assistance to kind of think aligning so that, you know, um, really pulling in all the efforts and streamlining the, the resources, um, financial and technical assistance to, to, to really make an effective implementation of, of the projects that they want to pursue, um, whether it's capacity building or infrastructure improvements and things like that. Um, and then another kind of regional effort um, is my colleague Ann Hurst um, has been um, working on and, and kind of um, supporting communities in terms of thinking about climate resilience zoning work. So um, in the next couple of months and going forward, um, she'll be continuing that conversation with communities to, to really think about how to integrate um, resilience kind of measures and elements in their planning efforts going forward as well in the policy ordinance or programs that, that can really enhance resilience um, planning. Um, so those are just some idea. Oh, and sorry, just one last thing is um, also Anne and Martin last year has been um, doing a research working, looking at different um, regional planning agencies across the country, thinking about different practices, um, additional practices, potential ideas that, you know, our environment team can, can work on and pursue. And so those are just um, something that we're currently brainstorming together to think of, of new way, for example, like sustainable infrastructure um, practice or waste management, other um, uh, aspect that have that cross connection with with the with um, you know the climate actions that we'll be working on, and then internally within MAPC we'll continue through um, platform like Climate Core to work with other staff to really make sure adaptation and resilience, but also just climate efforts in general are touch on uh, across the the project works that we're all um, pursuing. Thank you, Van. Uh, were there any questions for either Christian or Van? I see Buzz has his hand up. Buzz? Unmute. Buzz. But I'm only emeritus. I'm not supposed to be talking. Um, great presentation. Thank you very much. I'm particularly enthusiastic about the organization's focus, and you brought it up, on, on nature-based solutions. Um, and the mitigation banks, which I think in the, across the country have become a really interesting place uh, to do great climate work. And I don't think they've been adopted in New England as much as elsewhere. So it's a place where I think MAPC could make a real, a, a real difference. Um, I do raise two issues, questions, I guess. Um, one is in the present, in the work plan, there is nothing about the municipal vulnerability plans. And I know we've worked on them. Uh, and I know that they play the plans and municipal uh, vulnerability action 
play just a crucial role in the whole climate as well as the environment. So I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. And then I want to raise a yellow flag because I've been doing some work around the legislature and I've, I've heard some people become very, uh, some people we all know and love as very active and wanting to do alternative energy and offshore wind and all of that, who are talking very seriously about cutting back municipal uh, rights, uh, municipal powers, police powers, zoning and other police powers uh, in regard to transmission lines and electric distribution lines. And that's the balance that our local control versus getting alternative energy to our cities and towns and our people are really important. So I wonder if you speak very briefly to the M, to the municipal vulnerability plan plans and uh, and whether you've given thoughts to municipal regulatory authority over transmission lines and other alternative energy. I think Van may have some comments on this, but also Lizzie might. Yeah, I um, thank you. I can definitely speak a lot to the first piece, which is the vulnerability assessment. Um, so yeah, um, so, so two things. Um, one is that in our hazard mitigation planning work, um, we have been, and this is also under um, guidance of FEMA and MIMA, they have really particularly raised a lot more um, interest and awareness and encouragement to really think about um, climate impact as we work with communities to pre prepare and develop their hazard mitigation plan. So in that, that's kind of part of that vulnerability assessment that we incorporate into um, the, those planning works and, and really speak to communities and, and work with communities on that. Um, the second piece of that is, which is really exciting, is that EEA is actually <clears throat> in the process of um, um, developing a, an MVP planning, the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness MV, um, Program, uh, planning specifically the planning component. Um, they call it the MVP planning 2.0. And so um, we're excited um, to kind of monitoring and also following and finding ways to participate in the conversation as they, they update and develop this 2.0 program. Um, there'll be definitely uh, uh, um, opportunities for RPAs, especially MAPC to provide input and feedback and also help guide or you know participate in, in the development of that program that will um, kind of take that planning, the vulner vulnerability assessment planning to the next level for communities across the state um, as well. And so, um, you know, that that will be continuing and that that's an effort that we will um, following and, and participating in closely. Um, in terms of the transmission piece, maybe Lizzie, um, but I, I can't speak on that too much because I think, um, and I have no doubt, I think the clean energy department is following that um, and working on that more closely. Well, I would, I'm not quite sure if Lizzie has anything to add. We, we don't have a position on any of those transmission bills at the moment, but we can, we'll, we'll look into that. Um, <coughs> it's, it's clear that there are, there's a balance to be struck there. Um, I would note that I think MVP action grants particularly are mentioned in the environment program, but it is only one mention. Um, and, uh, and it is a pretty important part of what we do. Uh, normally, Buzz, we try and focus the work plan on strategic priorities that are a bit new or where we are advancing beyond uh, the work we've traditionally done. We are continuing to do lots of MVP projects. Sometimes they, as Van has indicated, <coughs> we see them in the context of a larger vulnerability planning process generally. Sometimes they are combined with hazard mitigation plans, sometimes they are combined with other plans, but we're continuing to do a lot of that in both the planning and the implementation space. Great, any other questions? Okay, Mark, do you wanna introduce the next topic? Yes, department? I think Eric, I, I think I'll go in the order that people arrived on the screen as best as I could tell. So. We're going to um, go to Eric Hove, who's going to describe the remainder of the strategic initiative section with a few key highlights. All right, thank you. Uh, Eric Hove, Director of Strategic Initiatives. I think I know everybody in the call. Nice to see you all. Um, just a couple highlights. Um, as you know, we just adopted the Metro Common 2050 plan. So we are moving into implementation 
of that plan, which will be a long-term undertaking. Um, the biggest um, event that we're planning for, which we hope will be in person, is the official launch of the plan. Um, we're targeting early May for this. Um, we really are hoping it will be an indoor, I mean, sorry, an outdoor uh, event um, and are kind of in the midst of planning for that uh, along with Sasha and the engagement team and government affairs and communications. We're also uh, rolling out, um, we're calling them Metro Common to You presentations to municipal partners and nonprofit community-based partners um, really just, uh, you know, kind of with two goals uh, in mind for this is one is for groups we haven't worked with or new municipal leadership. It's about um, building that relationship, getting to know each other, introducing to both our work and the plan uh, and exploring opportunities to, to collaborate and to work on actual projects together. And for long, long lasting partners, it's really just uh, to check in and continue to maintain those relationships and to have those conversations about some of the new priorities that uh, have emerged with the Metro Common Plan. And, uh, and again, to explore opportunities for, for future collaborative work together. Um, we are also working on the next um, three-year bar grant. Um, one, of the, one of the recommendations that came out of Metro Common uh, the planning process is as an agency, you know, how can we do more collaborative work? You know, many of our projects are two or three departments together, but uh, looking for opportunities to do even more of that collaboration and really try to attack these problems more holistically. So I think we have a real interest in doing more work together, you know, bringing like the climate and housing teams together, for example, um, as, as we work on new projects and hopefully with additional bar funding, that will be a really great opportunity to do more collaborative work really across departments. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple of things that my colleague uh, Ben Faust in the department's gonna be working on. He's more focused on the internal operations of the agency, um, working with departments and teams on aligning work plans and testing out new approaches and best practices um, to experiment with some of the, the new ideas that came through the plan. So that's part of uh, his charge is looking at you know, what's worked elsewhere, working with teams and departments and individuals on, on trying out these new ideas and also working with the equity team and Angela's team in terms of looking at how we can better operationalize equity in our planning approaches. So I'll stop there and see if uh, folks have, have questions for me. Anything for Eric? Lots to do to implement Metro Common, which he's gonna do all on his own, by the way. So we'll move on to Barry Keppert, who I think has joined our Director of Public Health to talk about a few key initiatives in the Public Health Department, where a lot is going on presently. Thanks, Mark. Um, can I just check with you? Can you hear me okay? Fantastic, okay. <clears throat> Joining by my phone. Um, so good to see everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to, to connect with you all. Um, I'm Barry Keppert, I'm the Director of the Public Health Department. Uh, Heidi Sucker is the Assistant Director of the Public Health Department as well, too. I guess I would just start out real quickly just giving you kind of the, the four broad pillars of our work, because I think that kind of frames up the rest of it. So one's around environmental health and climate change. And I guess I should say underlying all this is a focus on racial equity and health equity. Uh, second part of it is assisting our local health departments in the work that they do normally, but also in the response efforts around COVID-19. A third part of that is looking at food systems, in particular, thinking about issues around local production, access and affordability of healthy foods. And then the third part is actually looking broadly at social determinants of health. And that's ways that we're bridging partnerships with other sectors, hospitals and others to really invest in those things like the economic mobility, housing, um, access to open space, issues around mental and behavioral health to be able to support those areas of work. The things I would emphasize at the moment is that we continue to work really closely with a number of health departments on emerging shared services. It's a really wonderful example of what's possible when cities and towns work together to increase their capacity as well as their capabilities. I use those two words because one, we know local public health has been underfunded and underinvested in over the past decade, but likely longer than that. So what we're seeing is essentially new capacities emerge and that means expertise is around uh, epidemiology, around communicable disease, around public health communications. At the same time, we're actually seeing staffing increase in a really positive way, public health nursing, community health workers, epidemiologists, 
all critical positions from both taking care of both the day-to-day -day functions of a health department, but increasing connections and support for the residents that the local public health system is really there to support. Second piece of work I would highlight is our work around climate change, in particular, really beginning to embrace the work around how we respond to places where heat might really have the most impact. Um, as much as we talk about flooding, as much as we talk about other potential impacts from water, heat is one of the greatest drivers of both kind of short-term disability as well as death from people. And so we're seeing that increasing heat both on an annual level as well as in those sporadic kind of heat events that we see and we're seeing that more and more. That heat is also connected to issues around vectors, so mosquitoes, ticks, and it's also connected to really kind of uh, a reduction in the quality of air that we'd expect to breathe. So again, the air quality impacts that are happening to that. So in that work we're doing is both kind of community driven and community focused, working with resident researchers, working with others who are doing that work, as well as focused on structural components, like how we build our homes, how people's workplaces operate those particular elements. And then the last one I'll highlight is our work around food systems. Uh, MAPC has now been involved in setting up uh, um, local food councils and doing community food assessments in a number of municipalities, not only within our region, but through our partnership with the Department of Public Health and the Mass Emotion Program uh, throughout the state. So that work is really moving in a good direction towards in, in terms of implementation. How are we using our land for production, not only in places where we have large expanses of open space, <clears throat> but in places in urban areas? What are some of the creative endeavors we can do to build um, on those small pieces of land that exist, but also within and on buildings themselves, and how does that connect to the local economy? Um, and similarly, kind of with that connection with climate, how are we looking at both the food we're producing and how that will evolve as the climate and the weather systems change, but also what does it mean in terms of food waste and how we process that? Because we know that can both be something that can be recycled and reused and helped, but it's also something that can contribute more carbon dioxide and not necessarily help us kind of meet some of those carbon and greenhouse gas reduction goals that we have. Um, so I'll stop there, but just to give you some highlights, um, again, when we come out of COVID or at least kind of learn to kind of coexist with COVID a little bit more strongly, we're hoping to get some emphatic uh, work in these other areas as well. Thank you, Barry. Any questions for Barry? <clears throat> All right. I, I do want to say that I'm <clears throat> very proud of the fact that we have such a strong public health practice here at MAPC, it is still unusual. We're not the only ones, but it's still unusual among regional planning agencies throughout the country. And uh, it has certainly placed us in a good position to have a meaningful impact during the pandemic, far more so than we would otherwise have done. So thanks to Barry and his team. Um, and speaking of that, the Municipal Collaboration Department has also been front and center in overseeing our response to the pandemic and providing assistance and support to local governments as they struggle with impacts. And I'd like to present Mark Fine now, I think to close us out as the final presentation uh, on a few highlights of the Municipal Collaboration Department. Yeah, hello everyone. Yeah, Mark Fine here. Uh, I direct our Municipal Collaboration Department. Good to see you all again. And thanks for the time to talk about some of our work. Uh, well, I think, I think over the years you've gotten familiar with some of what we do, but I mean, just as an overview to refresh uh, folks' memories, uh, you know, our, our department, I guess, if, you know, we kind of have three divisions and, and three kind of areas of focus. And, you know, one, one big area of focus is collective purchasing and we do uh, goods and services purchasing for cities and towns. And we do that on, you know, a huge range of things, everything from fire trucks to fruits and vegetables for schools. And I would say, you know, over the last few years, and even through the pandemic, we really expanded that work uh, and, you know, have taken on a, you know, a whole array of contracts we didn't have before. Um, you know, so that's, that's one key area. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, in a bit about some of the focus areas for that. Another big piece of our work is kind of in the, you know, what we've kind of said, like, is emergency preparedness and public safety. And, you know, I think for years, we've been managing the statewide Homeland Security Grant Program. We also uh, help with the planning function for the Northeast Regional Homeland Security Council. Um, you know, and that's been a long, uh, an ongoing role in managing that grant funding and help plan how it's used. We then, you know, we've, we've been, we took on a new role in running the Health and Medical Coordinating Coalition for Region 3, which is Northeastern Massachusetts as well. And that, that, you know, was something we took on right before the pandemic, but obviously, you know, health and medical emergency preparedness 
was going to become a big topic and a big piece of work for us during the pandemic. And, you know, that's been a, a huge area of, of work and time uh, for people in my team. So we've, we've done that. And I think, you know, as you also know, like in this, in this area too, we, we manage the Shannon Community Safety Initiative Grant, which is an anti-gang youth violence prevention grant uh, as well. So those are kind of, you know, in each case, there's a threat of grant management, but a lot of it's program support and program development as well uh, in those areas. I guess, you know, when I think about new initiatives that we are looking to, uh, to roll out in, in that space, you know, we are launching an emergency preparedness practice. And I think that's, that's captured in our work plan. Um, you know, and basically I think, you know, what we've identified through the COVID crisis and, and otherwise was that, you know, communities often have emergency preparedness plans, but they sit on the shelf, they collect dust, they're not updated regularly, and they don't necessarily involve the range of stakeholders and municipal government needs to involve. And, you know, COVID, I think, shined a light on that is, you know, obviously it was, it was a unique and, you know, an intense crisis that continues, but, but uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of communities really weren't geared up to kind of think about how they respond and how they kind of test you know, test and, and exercise and, and kind of plan for plan for these things. I mean, it's one thing to have a written plan. It's another thing to exercise and drill against it and have some idea of how you'd actually respond in, in the moment. So I think we've identified that type of gap and we are looking to provide those type of services to uh, cities and towns across our region. And, and, you know, the staff we have that does our health and medical coordinating coalition work, they actually have, you know, the kind of skills and training to provide um, you know, to run exercise and provide these services and support. So, you know, we've already kicked off a few small projects in that space and are looking to, you know, market and, and, and make uh, communities across our, our region aware of what we can offer in that space. So, I mean, that, that's something we'll be doing over the next few months. We actually have some new communications materials that we'll be disseminating and we, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, the whole executive committee has that and can also share with stakeholders uh, in their space, you know, so that's that's a, a major new push we we're we're undertaking. Uh, you know, the last part of our 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 our, de our department that I want to just mention is this our municipal services work, and a lot of that work is focused on on shared services and supporting cities and towns to collaborate across uh, across lines. And you know, COVID has been a huge you know uh, driver for a lot of those efforts too. Uh, I would say, you know, Barry mentioned a lot of the public health capacity work. We've worked, you know, quite closely with, with Barry and, and the public health team in supporting probably about, you know, six to 10 uh, public health coalitions or groups of communities that are actually now sharing services uh, and working together uh, to deliver public health services. So that's been a huge area of growth. It's a huge amount of time we're managing grants and resources in each of those spaces. And that will continue to be, you know, a major uh, area of focus for our municipal services practice. Um, so, I mean, those are the kind of three three domains. I mean, I would say just on collective purchasing, uh, you know, in part, we, we've taken on probably, probably upwards of 150 contracts that we have under management now. Um, and, you know, in some cases, you know, a lot of the effort we would, we would spend with cities and towns is kind of pr promoting and, and uh, making communities aware of what we have under, under contract. And COVID, you know, in a sense has made that difficult because we're not out there at, you know, the public works expositions or the shows and the events that we usually would. We're not meeting with city and town officials quite in the same way. So we thought about other ways to market those services in the interim, and we're doing pretty well on that front. But I, I would say like a big area of focus we want to have is just getting back out there and getting, uh, you know, getting, you know, making, making our cities and towns aware of, of, of what we can offer and, and the uh, range of range of collective purchasing options that we provide. So, so that's a, another big area of focus. I mean, to some degree, we aren't looking necessarily to take on a lot of new major contracts. And we've expanded quite a lot, as I've said, you know, things like public works services. We basically, you know, public works equipment, we basically provide almost everything a public works uh, department would need when it comes to vehicles and equipment. Uh, so we're not necessarily looking to like broaden our offerings, but we want to make sure communities know what's there, know how to use our contracts and make the most of it. So that's another big area of focus for us. But um, yeah, glad to take any questions and, and uh, thanks for the time. Thanks, Mark. Are there any questions for Mark or for any of the other presenters? 
Okay, well, with that, I'm gonna just turn it back over to President Aaron. Okay, thank you, Mark. And I wanna first thank Annis, Vaughn, Christian, Eric, Barry, and Mark Fine uh, for being really flexible for us, for being thorough, for um, understanding that we need quorum to uh, adopt this part of the work plan. And I know you guys, a lot of you were running in and uh, you know, making other accommodations. And I really appreciate it um, because it's really important that we adopt the work plan, the second half of the work plan. Um, I'm gonna just pause real quick to make sure there are no other questions or comments. I think we kind of asked as we go, I think the work plan is great. And I think the work is obviously ongoing and in progress as we speak, but it's always good to adopt it formally. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Tom Daniel. Hi, sorry. Um, I just, I just wanted to say to, thank you for everyone. Um, sorry, I came in a little bit late, but <clears throat> the procurement assistance. I, I think that's um, sort of a, a secret. Not that it's a secret, but it, it's one of those unsung things that's super beneficial and helpful. So I just wanted to elevate that out there. That um, I think for MAPC, a lot of the work. Um, you know, there's tremendous working in all areas, but that, that intergovernmental and the municipal procurement assistance are, it's just a really practical thing that's super helpful, um, speaking as someone coming from municipality. So wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for joining us as well. Um, really appreciate it. All right, is there any other comments, questions? Okay, so not seeing any, um, at this time. So with that, I'm gonna ask uh, for a motion to adopt the work plan as um, received, presented, um, and kind of spoken about today. So I'll move. Thank you, Steve Olinoff for the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by John DePriest. Thank you, John, uh, for that. Any questions or comments before we go to a roll call vote? I see everyone putting their cameras on. It's nice. I see everyone's faces all at once here. Not seeing any? Great. So we are going to go to um, roll call vote. Uh, the vote before us is to adopt the second half of the MAPC work plan um, as discussed. Here we go. Sharonda? Keith? Aye. Karen? Adam? Aye. Bob Cohen? Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. Uh, Yolanda? Sandra? Aye. Mo? Tabor? Aye. Angie? Steve Olinoff? Aye. Caitlin? George? Aye. Courtney? Abstain. Uh, Jenny? Aye. Bandana? Abstain. Sam? Yes. Steve Silvera? Yes. Lauren? Mayor Spicer? Juan? Elaine? Abstain. And Aaron? Aye. So the motion, motion passes with three abstentions. Those three abstentions came from Courtney Rainey, Vandana Rao, and Elaine Vanya. Did I get it all, everyone? I think I did. So thank you so much. Thank you again, staff, for being so flexible and thorough. And please um, send our thanks and praise uh, to your departments uh, when you log off this call and get back to work. So thank you so much for joining us. All right, if it's okay with everyone, we're gonna go back to the beginning um, to item number three, which is the report of the treasurer. Sam, I'm sure you've been waiting uh, very patiently. So thank you for doing that. Um, so treasurer Sam, take it away. Thank you, President Aaron. And yes, a little bit of a time warp. We're gonna go in the Wayback Machine two. Uh, two income statements. I think on the um, agenda, it only has a September, but we're actually going to do September and October because we were able to get all the numbers for both of those months. Um, it's still the first quarter of the fiscal year. So that's sort of where we are in the, in the total uh, picture of things. 
And what we're tracking in these two sheets, uh, keeping our eye on is the, is the overhead rate, which is the relationship of administrative expenses to direct labor. And in both uh, cases, September 1st, uh, taking September uh, 1st, um, our overhead rate is 116.88, so 117%, which is below our approved, uh, state approved 118%. We, we like that. Um, and then if we go to October, we see that overhead rate drops even more to 112%, uh, meaning the relationship of administrative expenses is, is shrinking in, in relation to direct labor. Uh, that's good, and it leaves us at the end of October with a uh, with a cumulative uh, year to date up to that point, 116.3 percent, which is still good. We're still trying to stay below that 118 uh, percent, and we we like that, um, and that's good because we we have some some hires that are going to happen later in the year, deputy director positions. And so that will probably, uh, you know, put some pressure on the administrative expenses looking down the road a bit. Uh, but we're, we're happy about all of that. So overall, uh, the numbers look good. Uh, we are entering the mid-year budget uh, process. So the committee, the finance committee will be meeting in early February uh, to start that process. That uh, Tabor's on that committee, Yolanda's on that committee. We'll, we'll meet with, um, with Sheila and the team. Uh, and the only other thing to report is that the FY21 books are still open. We, that happens all the way through these uh, January, February, and by the end of March, those will be closed out. Um, nothing else to report at this time. That concludes the treasurer's report. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Hearing none, if I might, I'll hand it back to President Aaron for a, a motion to adopt except the report of the treasurer, can never remember which. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you so, oh, Tabor, do you need to say something? I'll make the motion. Oh, okay. Uh, that's what I was thinking you were doing. Uh, it's like we're sitting across each other from one another uh, back in Temple Place. Um, I knew what you were gonna say. So I see a motion um, before us from Tabor to accept the treasurer's report. Do I have a second? Second. I will second. Jenny beat you to the punch. So uh, second by Jenny Wright. Uh, yep. Any questions or comments at this time before? Not seeing any. All right, great. So roll call is required. Uh, here we go. Sharonda? Keith? Aye. Karen? Adam? Aye. Bob Cohen? Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda? Sandra? Aye. Mo? Tabor? Aye. Angie? Steve Olinoff? Aye. Caitlin? George? Courtney? Aye. I got you, George. Courtney? Thanks. <laughs> Courtney, did you say aye or abstain? Aye. Okay, I just want to make sure. Thank you. Uh, Jenny. Aye. Vandana. Aye. Sam. Aye. Steve Silvera. Aye. Lauren. Mayor Spicer. Juan. Elaine. Aye. And Erin, aye. A motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much uh, to Sam, the Finance Committee, Committee, Finance Committee, and uh, the finance department at MAPC, uh, thank you so much for all your diligence, attention, and hard work on making sure we're continuing to stay on track. Thank you so much. All right, next up on the agenda is uh, the report of the executive director. Mark, take it away. <clears throat> thank you very much, Erin. So there is no written report this month. There was an extensive written report last month, and there will be again in February. This will be a quick verbal, verbal update on a few key things. Um, a few departmental items that I wanna highlight, very few, and then I wanna discuss COVID issues a little bit. Um, first of all, um, I don't know if Anna is still with us. She probably signed off, but um, the arts and culture team, particularly Anna uh, Sengupta, of course, and Claudia Zarazua, um, 
sorry, Claudia Zarazua um, on her staff um, have been doing a lot of great work with George and the city of Somerville, which will culminate in a presentation tomorrow evening, which is available on Zoom and which I hope a few of you might agree to uh, or choose to sign into. Uh, the topic has been the disappearance of artist space in Somerville, but there are many generalizable lessons and policy recommendations about the very important economic and artistic and cultural objective of making sure that we have space available for artists in our communities throughout the metropolitan region. Uh, we all know that uh, the arts is an important part of our identity, an important part of our economy, and yet artists often uh, can be in a particular area and then get priced out as the area becomes more popular for housing or for technology, for a variety of activities. And individual communities and the Commonwealth need to adopt policies that will encourage the ongoing availability of artist space and hopefully some consistency so that artists can stay at least in a community, if not in the space where they currently are. I'm very proud of this work. It's very important. And I think it is, as I said before, generalizable to a lot of communities. So um, I will try and share. Oh, you're right. The meeting is tonight. It's because I'm still thinking it's Tuesday. It's one of those weeks. It feels like the second workday. So I think it's Tuesday, but it is Wednesday and the meeting is tonight. And uh, unless someone is able to put it into the chat, uh, I will follow up with a notice to all executive committee members, maybe four or five of you can, can join us to see. I think it will be very informative. Uh, in the Clean Energy Department, I want to pay particular congratulations to our director, Cami Peterson, who has recently uh, been appointed to the Governor's Commission on Clean Heat. A very important role in trying to figure out the future of uh, emissions reduction in the built sector, uh, particularly the vast majority of buildings which are not new, but which are in existence already. Uh, we expect that commission will focus particularly on some of the larger structures, but eventually We'll be making policy recommendations that might uh, apply to a broader range of structures because a large part of our emissions reductions in this state have to come from buildings and they have to come from transportation since those are the two biggest sectors. Um, I'm very proud of Cami for this appointment. Uh, I might note, uh, no surprise, Rebecca Davis in her new role has also been appointed. So both MAPC and MACP are represented on this new commission. And uh, uh, honestly, the two of them could simply probably write all the new rules and maybe in five shape. But um, we're, we're excited about that. It's an honor and uh, congratulations to Cami for that work. I'd like to talk to you about a few items uh, related to COVID. I'm gonna start with the office and then talk about the region and the Commonwealth more broadly. So the office has entered into a closed status or a remote only status. Uh, we implemented that about a week before Christmas. Uh, initially, a uh, plan to continue it to January 14th, but decided to extend it at least through the end of the month. Um, we, you know, we were in a partially open status. I would say there were about 10 people in the office on any given day. There were a few regulars like myself and Mark Rassicott and Dave Lobsenheiser. And then there were folks that just came in more occasionally. Uh, but there were, you know, there, there, were, there were people and there were voices on all three floors. And to be perfectly honest, that's kind of a blessing. Um, we just felt with the surge in Omicron, it was necessary to anticipate that and to uh, bring the office into a closed status once again for about a month's period of time, maybe a little bit longer. It's still possible if people need to go into the office for a particular reason, we have a protocol whereby they can do that. Uh, so the office is not completely empty. Uh, I go in to water my plants once a week because I don't trust that job to anybody else. And, uh, and other people are in there for a variety of reasons. Finance certainly needs to be there from time to time to cut checks and do other things. And we do have a few people whose work is just, uh, you know, better able to be done from the office than it is from home. Um, I, I am eager to get back to a partially open status. We will be following the metrics in order to do that. Uh, I have to say that we have seen more COVID among our staff and their families and more um, contacts with people who have had COVID that do not always necessarily result in our staff getting COVID, but more contacts 
than, than we've ever seen in the course of this pandemic. I don't think that our experience in that regard is different. So to maximize the possibility of keeping people safe and recognizing that most of our work can be done, even if it's somewhat uncomfortably from a remote setting, uh, that's what we've decided to do. And it's my hope and prayer that you know we'll be back in a partially open status uh, in the near future. Uh, the numbers seem to be pointing in that direction. Uh, keep our fingers crossed and, and hopefully we'll get there. It is still my long-term goal. Uh, it used to be a short-term goal. Now it's a somewhat longer-term goal to get the office fully opened. Uh, Angela Howard, Barry Keppard, Lizzie and Mark, Rascott and others, Margie and Allison have all been working to try and help with this effort. Uh, but it's not yet time, in our opinion, to safely reopen the office uh, in its entirety. Uh, when we do, uh, all staff will be uh, required to be there at least two days a week on average. And we will have a, a rotating and sort of an engineered schedule of people coming into the office so that uh, you know it's not too crowded. But uh, uh, so the goal will be to have it more crowded and to have more person-to-person -person contact uh, than has been the case uh, during the past uh, couple of years now. Um, I'm hoping we're gonna get there in the spring. As Eric indicated, Eric Hove indicated, we are beginning to think about doing some events uh, in person. Uh, we were until recently holding officers meetings in person in, uh, in Aaron's Town Hall. Um, it is my hope that we will be able to do the annual meeting in person, uh, maybe outdoors. And we are very hopeful that we will be able to do the um, uh, Metro Common launch. Uh, outdoors sometime, probably around the same time, May, we may even decide to combine those events, events in one way or another, we'll see. Um, uh, there was one particular area related to this that I wanna mention, and that is the question of our staff attending meetings uh, at individual cities and towns. Um, prior to the closure of the office, um, our basic policy was that if uh, folks were holding indoor uh, meetings, um, that were reasonably as safe as the office was, staff was encouraged to participate in those meetings on site. Um, they could still decide not to. And there were some cases where those protocols might not have been in place that we were also allowing staff to exercise their judgment if they wanted to go. For example, a lot of places, you know, would have indoor meetings with a mask requirement, but not with a vaccine mandate. The MAPC office has both, uh, but still some staff uh, felt comfortable because of their own status, their own family circumstances, uh, and their commitment to their work to participate. Since the office has entered a closed status, I have clamped down on that more. And basically staff are not attending those meetings. Um, that does not always mean they're not attending a meeting with a couple of people in a community to discuss a project, but it does mean they're not going to the large public meetings that are uh, you know, generally, uh, I think, somewhat more risky. Again, we're, we're hoping to get away from this, but I think it is the right decision at this moment in time. Sometimes it creates a little bit of friction with our cities and towns, um, particularly some of those that are more, uh, shall I say, aggressively open. Uh, but for the most part, everyone has been exceedingly understanding. And I appreciate that. I wanted to express that appreciation here. Um, we have, uh, speaking more broadly, uh, we have attempted to respond to the Omicron crisis, not only by re-upping our numbers of phone calls, uh, particularly with experts that have been very, very well attended by mayors and managers, but also by sending out a series of fairly detailed communications to our cities and towns with steps that they can take, uh, particularly uh, lacking uh, state, uh, state actions in some of these areas. Uh, steps that individual cities and towns can take to try and protect their, their residents and their workers uh, and their economies. Uh, the first of those communications focused on masking and vaccine requirements. The second focused on procurement of a whole number of goods and services. And the third, which is about to go out in the next few days, uh, I think is fo focused mainly on testing and boosters, uh, but that's still, that's still in design. Uh, so I don't want to um, be too committing on that. Lizzie may have more to add or Barry or Mark if they're still on. Uh, we consider these communications to be extremely important. Our goal is to provide as many resources as we possibly can, often quietly and behind the scenes, 
to our cities and towns, and then to have dozens and dozens of conversations with individual communities about implementing them. Sometimes the uptake is very dramatic. Sometimes it's less dramatic. I know in regard to the first one, we saw a lot of communities move toward mask requirements. Some of those that had none implemented it in public spaces. Some of those that had it in public spaces implemented it uh, more universally. We've seen a good deal of movement in that regard on vaccine proof of vaccination requirements in indoor settings. Uh, although I think that is a good policy and I wish more communities would adopt it, the uptake has been relatively limited. Congratulations to those who have. Um, and the same is true on procurement, on testing, on boosters, on, on lots of things. Uh, but we always want to be able to provide assistance and support to help communities move forward. Um, I'll close by saying something a little bit about the future. So all of us are hoping that Omicron is the last variant that we never have to learn any more, or in my case, dust off any more of my knowledge of the Greek alphabet that I got at Boston Medical School uh, and learn no more, um, no more Greek letters. And, you know, could be uh, the flu after World War I disappeared very suddenly. But it is also possible, and I would suggest that it's probably more likely, that we will see additional variants. They will hit us from time to time. Uh, and that we can no longer deal with these as one-offs where they hit. We're not quite sure what they're going to be like. We don't take enough action quickly enough because we're not really sure. And a lot of the actions are unpopular. And we have no long-term vision or system for how we deal with recurrent variants over time. And I think that one of my greatest commitments moving forward to try and work with our cities and towns and very importantly with the Commonwealth and with the federal government, particularly with the Commonwealth. Uh, they're a little more in reach, in our reach than the federal government is. To try and say the greatest likelihood is that this is going to continue with us for some period of time. And we need to have plans in place when there's a new variant and where there's a surge that we can implement right away to keep that surge under control, to get us through it as quickly as possible and then to try and move on, hopefully into a better space. Uh, we can't keep handling these things as though they are a new thing that we don't know about, that we didn't know would happen, and whose dimensions we can't predict, because they are likely to be with us for a long time. That requires a change in thinking, requires a change in expectations. Um, it can be seen as you know, a loss of hope, but I think it can be seen as a gain of hope because it is a notion that even though this may be with us for a while, there are ways to manage it. There are always ways to make it better and to be prepared. Uh, preparing for emergency needs is a core value of this agency. And as such, I hope we can continue to work with people to implement that over time, even if the pandemic, even if COVID is going to be with us for a longer period of time. So I just wanted to say a few words about that. I will see if Lizzie or Barry or Mark, if they're still on the line, have anything further to say. Um, but if not, uh, that will conclude my ED report for this month. Lizzie, you're good? Yeah, I see. I, okay, thank you. Um, and I'm not seeing anyone else's face pop up. So thank you so much, Mark, um, for that. Looks like Adam, I think. Oh, I think he was just popping. Do you have a question, okay. Adam? More of a comment, very quick, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you, you know, on the on the COVID measures, um, mostly I wanted to compliment Mark and the leadership team for their prudence and responsibility in protecting staff appropriately from this latest surge. Um, and then to the to the last point about engaging with local governments, I, I hope we can keep this as an ongoing conversation. Because I, I think one of the biggest frustrations I've faced in my role is that we're making decisions, you know, as an entity that if not adopted by other entities at all different levels, right? State level, nonprofit, private, are somewhat meaningless in the grand scale. So I've been thinking a lot more recently about how to protect employees while at work and feeling like the rest is a near impossibility. I'd love to. I'd love to be convinced otherwise <laughs> of that. Um, but uh, more than anything, I wanted to say I, I would like to be a partner in that work because I think what you said is right, Mark. That this, in some shape or form, is not going away, and we need to 
formalized tools for dealing with it. Thank you, Adam. And I think quite a few of us, particularly those who work in municipal government agree with that sentiment. So thank you. Any other questions or comments at this time? Okay, great. We'll move on to the next item, which is um, legislative update. And I'll call on uh, the legislative chair, Keith, uh, for a little bit of an update. Uh, thanks very, very much, uh, Aaron. Uh, we do not have any action items uh, for our uh, report this month, but there is a legislative update. Uh, a lot happening. I know a lot of us are, uh, our eyes are focused on a February 2nd deadline for legislative committees to favorably report out our favorite bills. Um, and, um, and so uh, why don't I I'll turn it over to uh, Lizzie. Thanks, Keith. I'm going to be trying to be quick as I um, run through some of these updates, but just kind of wanted to make sure everyone knows what's happening in and around the state house. So, um, as Keith indicated, we're the legislature is actually pretty active right now because they are trying to get out as many bills and address as many bills before Joint Rule 10 Day, which is. Uh, February 2nd, it is the date by which all timely filed bills have to have action taken on them. Um, we are hearing there's a very good chance that that will be extended, but we are seeing every day just kind of a flurry of activity from the state house and a number of the coalitions that we work very closely with are kind of asking us to um, reissue letters of support and weigh in with legislators on a number of, of different bills. I think two bills that we're following pretty closely around Joint Rule 10 are the SAFE Act, which was just reported out of committee that would make the updates to our public health infrastructure. Um, and the public banking bill, which was a priority that Metro mayors took this year that has not yet been reported out of committee, and the number of climate and clean energy bills, um, I should also add that we're following around Joint Rule 10 Day. Um, I wanted to also note that we're also just about to be inside the budget process for FY23 that will kick off. Um, I think it's actually this week, if I have my Wednesdays counted right, that the governor will file um, his budget. Actually, no, it's next Wednesday. Um, the governor will file his budget, which will essentially kick off the, um, the budget process for the fiscal year. Um, we are already putting together our budget priorities. Uh, some folks with a crystal ball think that the legislature is definitely going to take up the ARPA 2.0 spending bill alongside of the state budget. Other folks with a different crystal ball feel like they might not actually do that or they'll only take part of it. So um, we are kind of watching that as well and kind of putting together our priorities around um, whatever second ARPA spending bill comes out. To that end, the legislature did, we did see coming out of the House this week, a um, COVID emergency spending bill, which does include some of the provisions around open meeting law that we've been following very closely um, relative to the amount of ARPA dollars that are available, which is $2.3 billion. It's a relatively small money bill, um, but it's still millions of dollars in investments for um, testing in particular. And we are combing through that very quickly. We expect the House to, to actually weigh in this week on that. So we feel like our best avenue of advocacy is in the Senate. So we're looking at that bill very closely. I think generally we're very supportive of the provisions in there, though a little bit of a question as to like why they're doing some of this right now um, and not like a go, but that's okay. It's, it's good to try to move the right thing whenever you're ready to do it. Um, so uh, we might be weighing in with support, but then trying to strengthen some of the provisions that were included in that. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to bring to your attention is that last week, Governor Baker filed what um, is called a general government bond bill. This can be, um, it's different than our environmental bond bill or our transportation bond bill. It includes just kind of like a number of provisions on um, a bunch of different um, areas, but including uh, small business, and economic development and broadband initiatives, and then some um, pieces around procurement as well. So we are also looking into that. I think that'll kind of, my guess is move a little more slowly through the course of the legislative session. So I feel like we have a little more time to kind of digest what's in there and see what other pieces we might want to include in that bond. Um, 
And I think that's everything that's kind of like the quick overview of what's happening in the building. Um, I think a couple members of the government affairs team are on. So if I miss anything, hopefully they'll either check me in the chat or let me know. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer any questions if folks have them. Great. Uh, yeah. Sam? Uh, just a quick question. Um, since COVID is extending, do you, is the governor, I, and I don't know the technicalities of it, is online meeting going to continue further than April or whenever it was supposed that's, to be? That's the question. So this COVID emergency bill does actually extend it a little further into the summer. It doesn't actually address it completely. You know, we have started, I, and I think we in our advocacy around some of these um, meeting provisions have been encouraging the legislature to actually just make a final decision on this because honestly, like even regardless of COVID, some of the practices that communities have started to employ have been really helpful and have really increased um, community participation and access. So we would like them to stop extending the um, COVID provisions and actually just make a decision. Uh, they do not yet seem inclined to do that. Um, so, you know, we're going to continue that advocacy. I think in the beginning, it was appropriate to kind of refer to it as continuing the, um, like the COVID procedures. Uh, but I actually think it's time to, to think about it from like a good government perspective. We have a lot on that in Metro Common, as you all know. So I think we might start pivoting in that direction in our advocacy and, and sort of the tone of our advocacy. Yeah, but for right now, we don't have a final fix. We have an, ex we might have an extension until, um, the summer. The odd thing, in my opinion, is just that they um, they seem reluctant to extend these things, yet they keep the building essentially shut. So uh, seems it seems fine for them, but not particularly for the, for the rest of us and for our cities and towns. That is a little frustrating. I would note one more thing, if I could, on. Um, on COVID spending is we are continuing to focus on the issue of additional funds for downtown revitalization, which was one of the big topic areas the governor pushed for and with which we strongly agreed that was not funded significantly in the, um, in the first ARPA bill. Uh, but we are trying to push for that. We are continuing to make the argument for that this time around. Whether we'll succeed or not, I do not know. Okay, great. Thank you, Lizzie and Mark. Are there any other questions? Seeing none at this time, we're going to keep this agenda moving. Next up on the agenda is um, the date of the next executive committee meeting, which is obviously a misprint since today is January 19th, so that can't be the next date. I have on my calendar Wednesday, February 16th, um, which I believe is the date. It is the week before school vacation. If uh, that impedes your typical schedule, uh, February 16th uh, is the week before that. Is that correct, Mark? That is correct, and I apologize for the error, Erin. Thank it you is, for catching that. It is no big deal. All right. So please make sure on your calendars that <laughs> you mark February 16th as the date of the next meeting. Um, of this group. And uh, my last question, Mark, is there anything uh, not known uh, to share uh, at the time of the posting? I think we, I don't have the agenda up in front of me, but I think we were going to discuss executive committee vacancies. If, that, if, if that's on there, then fine. If it's not on there, then we'll take it up under other business. Uh, you will take it up under other business then. Okay. So there are likely to be some um, vacancies on the executive committee. There is a healthy legal debate within MAPC as to whether or not there are already vacancies on the committee, but I am going to not attempt to dispose of that legal question in this setting. Um, obviously, Mayor Curtitone uh, and uh, Mayor Spicer are no longer the leaders of Somerville and Framingham respectively. Uh, those positions um, will likely become vacant when the new mayors uh, make new appointments uh, as representative and alternate. But that does not mean that they continue in their seats on the executive committee because those will be different people in all likelihood who are appointed. It is, 
Um, I mean, George is obviously here. Perhaps he will be one of the appointees, but I don't think he's going to be the mayor. So um, in all likelihood, so um, we will probably need to announce to the um, uh, council that those vacancies will need to be filled. And if we can get that done within, I believe, 30 days prior to the March 2nd uh, council meeting, we will ask the caucus of city representatives at the council meeting to elect two new members to the executive committee. Of course, Somerville or Framingham would be eligible to run, so would any of the other cities. Uh, similar but not identical situation for the city of Boston. Uh, I think it's fair to say that that seat is functionally vacant at the moment, since um, neither Marty Walsh, Kim Janey, John Barrows, or Caitlin Pesafaro are at the city at the moment. And um, the one difference there is that the Boston seat on the executive committee is a permanent seat. They are not elected. So when Mayor Wu makes a new appointment of a member or an alternate to the uh, position, then uh, to her positions, then um, one of those people will be um, a new member of the executive committee and they'll be able to serve at that point in time. I should note that um, at the March 2nd council meeting, which will be virtual, uh, we are expecting to do at least two things that are worthy of note. One is we'll be giving out the Davidson um, Staff Achievement Award to a deserving member of the staff. The immediate preceding recipient of that award is with us today, Margie Weinberger. And there will be a new person uh, who will be receiving that award at the March 2nd meeting. We will also be doing the ever popular uh, panel of new mayors. We are hoping that we will be joined by as many as possible of Mayor Wu, Mayor Sasitsky, Mayor Verga, Mayor Nicholson, and Mayor Ballantyne, who are the five new mayors of cities in the Boston region. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, just for some clarification, the March election for those two vacancies, for those two city seats, will only serve yeah. until the annual meeting in May. So I just want to kind of be clear on that. So the this might be a great time if you are a city delegate, if you're watching this, you're already a super fan <laughs> of these meetings, you might as well attend them as a voting member. Uh, but it might be a nice way to kind of test um, the water and see if you like it or, you know, uh, really step up and just do a short term um, seat. Just just some food for thought for any interested city party who is not before us and does not is not currently represented. Uh, that might be some food for thought. And then we'll do regular old elections um, in May at the annual for a full term. Right, Mark? That's correct. Right. All right. I believe if there is nothing else before us, I believe we are uh, kind of finished with the agenda. So with that, I'd love to ask for a motion to adjourn. I see John DePriest popping up. Are you going to do it, John? I'll make the motion to adjourn. All right. And who's going to give me that second? Second, second. All right. Thank you, Tom Daniel. So we have the motion to adjourn by John DePriest with the second uh, by Tom Daniel. <laughs> Uh, any questions, comments, concerns? Not seeing any, great. So if everyone could come off mute, I am going to do the attendance very quickly, um, but I will list everyone. And I do wanna note that I do, even though someone may be absent when roll is call in the beginning, I still read every name just in case someone comes late or pops in and I don't see them, okay? Um, all right, here we go. Sharonda. Keith. Hi. Karen Canfield. Adam? Yes. Bob Cohen. Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? Yes. John Dupree? Yes. Yolanda? Sandra? Yes. Mo Tabor Angie? Steve Olinoff? Yes. Caitlin George? 
Yes. Courtney. Yes. Jenny. Okay. Jenny. Yes. Bandana. Sam. Yes. Steve Silvera. Yes. Lauren. Mayor Spicer. Juan. Elaine. And Erin. I. Great. With that, the motion passes. Thank you all for joining us. The meeting is adjourned at 1253. I hope you all have a safe and healthy rest of the week. Have a good one. Thank you very much, everyone.